It's all very surreal and Buckingham Palace is absolutely stunning. And I had gone with my dad and my mum and my older daughter. And you go into this room and they give you this briefing. The thing that I remember was Hugh Laurie was standing behind us and he was very tall. And somebody said, would you like to go and get it together? And we said, yeah, definitely. Why not? And about 15, 20 minutes later, they called our names. And I just looked at her and I'm like, oh my God, they've made a mistake. We're going to be chucked out. Like, this isn't real. <laughs> and I had these brand new Chanel shoes on and you have to go up to the Queen and then you have to walk backwards. You're not allowed to turn your back to her. Mm-hmm. So I felt like I was like moonwalking because I'm like, <laughs> you know, slipping on the carpet. In your Chanel shoes. And then when we... That she she apparently spoke to us for quite a while. I don't really remember because it's a bit of a blur, but my mm-hmm. dad obviously was watching and he said, oh, she spoke to you longer than she spoke to anyone else. That might have just been my dad <laughs> being soppy. But um, And then as you go out, you go into this sort of ante room and they take the badge off you. And I started crying because I thought they'd taken it away. <gasps> and I was like, oh my God, they've taken it away. And Ruby was like, they're just putting it in a box. <laughs> so... I think the whole thing is like heightened emotion. Hello and welcome to Anatomy of a Leader show with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of HVO Search. Founders, CEOs, and lone HR directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life, the failures they faced, what they wish they knew before they started and the hurdles they had to overcome. If you want to be inspired, surprised and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top, you're in the right place here on Anatomy of a Leader. Like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will change the way you think and may even change your life. In episode 12, I spoke with the amazing Millie Kendall, MBE, CEO of the British Beauty Council, founder of a PR agency, Brand Stand Communications, and Millie of the beauty brand, Ruby and Millie. She's unpretentious and overly modest about her achievements. She has been tirelessly campaigning for the British beauty industry and has given a voice to so many independent business owners who would have had an even harder time during the pandemic. We talked about her frustrations with the industry being patriarchal, about her inspiring survivor grandmother, and the fun stories about her life, including receiving an MBE from the Queen. Millie is humble but a true risk taker, someone who thinks nothing is impossible. Well, listen to the full episode number 12 and discover it for yourself. Millie, so Hi. good to see you. <laughs> I'm so excited to meet with you. I know we've had some, yeah, some clubhouse conversations, some, interaction. yeah. some interactions during yeah. our interesting COVID world. Yeah. And, um, but really good to see you in the flesh. I know. Nice to be here. Nice yeah. to be out in the flesh. Isn't I'm really it? enjoying the past few weeks. I've been out quite a lot. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Events and parties and just getting to sort of see people in real life and people that I've I've hired people that I've never met in Isn't real that life. incredible that we're so just weird. living in this world where, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, we haven't met before, but we're working with them. Yeah. And then you see them and actually we still get pretty good impression of what they like. I just yeah. find that fascinating. Do you know what? I was thinking the other day. So uh, one of the girls that we hired during COVID, she started as a volunteer and then we hired her in January, I think this year, February this year. Right. And she's looks on because you only see people on zoom and she looks so petite and very quite mild and sweet and quiet and petite and she came to visit the office and she's really tall she looks like a model <laughs> and I had no I don't know why I didn't think that I thought mm. you know I didn't imagine mm. her to be tall at all it's so funny you say that about height I've been thinking I mean I've been a headhunter for a long time I think what coming up to 15 years and a lot of the conversations I have are initially on the phone and then you get to meet people and I have this thing where I can gauge a person's height based on the conversation I don't know how 
you know, I think a lot of people think I'm tall because I've got a deep voice and I'm quite sort of like, you know, mm. I, I don't know if the word powerful, but I'm quite sort of um, uh, demonstrative in a sort of meeting situation. So mm. I kind of like to be in control a little bit and uh, or a lot. <laughs> and um, I went to meet somebody from Hearst Publishing and she said, my God, you're so much shorter than I thought no. you were. And I was like, <laughs> maybe I come across, I don't know, but I also like to sit up like I in my, de my desk, in my office, I like my chair really high mm. to the point where it actually doesn't fit very well with my desk, mm. but I don't know why, but I like to sit up quite high. Um, it's like, yeah, you know, the, the, also, you know, you're such a big personality and yeah. you have, you know, so vocal on social media as well. And it's one of the things that I was kind of surprised that I was like digging and I didn't realize that you are the co-founder of the British Beauty Council. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't really shout about it, but you're doing such incredible work. And this is something that I've certainly I noticed. Because I forget sometimes. Right. <laughs> because right. it's like, you know, when you're in it, and you're like yeah. on this treadmill. I forget that we, yeah, I forget that we, well, there were three of us that founded it, mm. but I am one of the co-founders. Mm. Um, it feels like ancient history probably is why, because it was so long ago when we decided to do it that mm. that it's- um, It's like so part of you already. Yeah. Mm. I think a lot of the, the idea behind it sort of stemmed from the fact that I had had so many different careers in the industry that I could sort of see quite a sort of 360 degree view of how the industry works. So I've, you know, I, I ran a shop, I was a junior washing hair in a hair salon, I did a bit of makeup, freelance, I created a brand, I launched other people's brands, I did PR and marketing, I did some retail management for people. Yeah. I've done so many different things. I had a column in Marie Claire, I even had a column in the Sun newspaper at one point. So there were uh, so many things, I did a TV show, I wrote a book. I found my book yesterday. <laughs> um, and so when you've done so many things, you kind of can see that maybe the industry isn't represented in its entirety to the public. People, the public don't know that you could be a journalist but specialize in beauty or you could be a television presenter and specialize in beauty or you, you know, there's so many things you can do in our industry um, and and but you can come to it from somewhere else and have beauty as a specialism. Yes. And so I just felt that it was time to sort of promote the best mm. of the British beauty industry. And I feel you do that so well. You give the stage to so many businesses and brands and not only through kind of your PR consultancy where you help to do that, but through the, the council, you know, itself. And this is something that I feel like I really admire and respect you for because you're right. I mean, I didn't necessarily understand the beauty industry like that as well, because there's so many independents, there's so many mm. small businesses. There's a lot of women who have yeah. been so yeah. impacted by what's happened yeah. during COVID. And I think you've done a fantastic job. Yeah. Really I mean, you have to have the data. The thing mm -hmm. is, is that I, you know, nothing, nothing that I, um, the British Beauty Council and the sort of content that we put out and the data and the information isn't my opinion. Yeah. I'm very conscious <clears throat> that if I don't have the raw data and the data isn't provided by experts, then I don't really have a leg to stand on. And so if you're going to sort of shout from the rooftops and have a platform um, to be able to share information, that information has to be credible and has to, you have to have the backup. So when we did the valuation of beauty, we used an organization called Oxford Economics who work um, frequently with government to provide financial data to the gov to government, British government. So it was important for us to use them in terms of valuing the sector and understanding the thing, you know, how many people work in the industry, how many of us, how many of us are women that work in the industry. It's 88% women, 95% of our businesses are SMEs, which is small, medium enterprises. So, but, but if you don't have that data, mm it's very difficult to do this job yeah. without other people providing you the information. Mm -hmm. So you rely on other people and, you know, as a nonprofit, you have very limited funding. So um, giving people the opportunity to get involved and to help drive this forward is not just a pleasure, it's a necessity mm -hmm. <laughs> because I couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. There were only two of us that worked for the British Beauty Council up until January of this year. It's amazing. Yeah. So much with such a small yeah. team. But I think that that's partly because we we utilize the sort of expertise of so many 
other people and they give us their time for free and people have a limited amount of time so you need more people it's so collaborative i mean that's yeah. that's amazing yeah i mean what do you find the most frustrating about the industry oh i'll always find the sort of um the patriarchal sort of society and the fact that sometimes certain aspects of of life you find you're just living in like the 1950s um <laughs> frustrating I think mm-hmm. that's just a personal thing for me is that I think that um there's you know people can look down on people working in the beauty industry we're not educated enough we're the people that couldn't get a job doing something else so we ended up you know becoming beauticians and um I, I find that very frustrating mm-hmm. I find the fact that if you're a journalist and you are a beauty journalist, for some some reason, uh, people will think you're not as credible as a features journalist or a financial mm-hmm. journalist. Journalist is a journalist. If you just choose to write about something you love mm-hmm. and your passion, that's, wh- why is that no, why is that not as good as, okay, maybe a war correspondent, you could say is probably, you know, up the top mm-hmm. of the sort of journalism tree. Um, but yeah, that, that, that frustrates me. And I and I think that it's because we live in this patriarchal society where, you know, men have really um, determined the way our lives are run to some degree. Mm. I, I still find that very... Equality to me is a real issue. Mm. I mean, how have you found... Or inequality, actually, I should say. Yes. No, there's that something, that's a subject that's really close to my heart especially working in sort of fashion and beauty industries mm. and seeing that you know predominantly the workforce is female yet at the senior levels you know we've got yeah. men kind of controlling and making the decisions on behalf of the customer i mean let's face it yeah there's i, I mean if so there's strange. if there's 88 percent of our our industry is female 12 percent mm. then is male me, the men have the top jobs mm-hmm. and i was saying to somebody recently uh, it was a journalist actually who works for the Financial Times, and we were talking about the fact that female hairdressers. That you try to name a famous female hairdresser. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know them because mm-hmm. um, I'm in the industry. But if you ask the public, they'll mm-hmm. know male hairdressers, even though there's fewer of them. Mm-hmm. But that they're, they're more recognisable because they get more visibility than maybe female hairdressers mm-hmm. do. So. That's true. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah, it's a frustration for sure. And what challenges have you faced being a woman in business? Oh, exactly those kind of, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I mean, exactly that really. I worked for a Japanese company many, many, many years ago and um, my boss was French and, you know, I really thought that, that that he picked me out of a group of people to come and work for him in Europe because he thought I was capable or clever or and I remember him saying something like sort of referring to the way I looked as opposed to Mm. how I thought Mm. as as being one of the reasons why I was hired for the job and I just I was I'm still to this day stunned that a it was mentioned but b that I wasn't there on my merit Mm -hmm. as a capable manager or you know middle management uh, employee at the time so that those kind of things i think have really they stick with you you yeah, know they do you know you you start to question yourself you feel very imposter like am i here because i can do this job well or am i here because i just represent well and that's an interesting thing for the beauty industry as well and kind of the standards that we're setting because if you're chosen based on your looks then that's what you're supposed to maintain as well and then you know with age You've seen me <laughs> i mm. never do <laughs> i mean i don't ever i'm not a gr- well gro- i'm not into the whole grooming th- you know mm. personally i don't mind you know I, but as in like i'm yeah. saying you as a yeah, no, kind of I like a mean, generalist yeah, yeah, you yeah. as in like if that's how, the reason why you're picked and not on your merit yeah. then that kind of puts more pressure on you having to maintain that and you know this idea is like oh if i don't maintain that i might lose it because someone else is going to come along who for whatever reason yeah but but equally just because i chose this as a career and sure i wasn't educated in sort of traditional sort of um 
didn't go, you know, I, I didn't even finish high school really mm-hmm. or go to university, but does that, I don't know if that means I'm stupid. It doesn't either. <laughs> Definitely you know, not and, that. And so to actually feel that mm-hmm. there was no, um, I wasn't there, I, to feel that I was there because of something other than, mm. you know, the fact that I could think outside the box and I was creative, I felt, you know, I felt that I was clever enough to have that job. And it was, mm. it was really, you know, it was really demeaning actually. And you kind of look at like, what was the reason for saying that? Was it to demean me, to keep me down, to keep me where I, you know, where I could be managed or controlled or, um, and so, yeah, I think that's sort of, those kind of things really stick with you. Mm. And I, and I, and so I think a lifelong frustration really of the sort of patriarchal sort of superiority mm. in the workplace, I find incredibly frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. I think that's probably my lifelong, you know, work battle. Really. My lifelong battle, yeah. Mm-hmm. My mom was like a real feminist, so I do think that I've got that in my DNA a little mm-hmm. bit, yeah. Who did you look up to when you were growing up? Um, oh my god, my grandmother was amazing. My grandmother was like <laughs> a sort of Russian immigrant who was like dripping in furs and kept all her shoes in bags and mm-hmm. I would watch her put her makeup on every day and she would, I lived with my grandparents quite a lot during my childhood and um, my grandmother was amazing. Mm. She was sort of glamorous, but just had the most wicked sense of humor. <laughs> she was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. And she just took no shit from anyone. <laughs> like she really didn't, you know, she was a fighter. I mean, imagine she was like, you know, born in Odessa, mm. which is on the Rush, Russian Polish border. And then they they the family her father and her brother moved to paris to kind of scope it out before bringing the rest of the family there were eight kids Mm -hmm. and then her brother died and her father sort of managed to bring the family out and then she ended up in belgium during the war and then um but she had uh by the during the war in the middle of the war she already had a one-year-old child and then her husband was part of the resistance and was killed and she was only 19 when he died. They'd been married for a year. And so she, there she was, a sort of widow at the age of sort of 18, 19 years old with a one-year-old baby. And she'd had to give my aunt to her family to look after. And it was like, not, you know, this is an 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid, really, mm. living this terrible, you know, mm. horror story, really. And then she met my grandfather, who was... Um, uh, he was British, but he was a secretary for Mountbatten, one of the secretaries. I think there were probably more than one. And he was in Brussels and they met and he brought her to London. Mm, what an amazing but story. But she had this like sort of, you would never know from looking at her that she came from this sort of village, mm-hmm. you know, that if they had no money. You know, she wasn't she, a wealthy young woman mm. when they landed in, in Belgium. So, but... She, you would never have been able to tell. Survivor and just such yeah, determination. Yeah. Mm. I think there's a, a lot of people have those kind of stories. And I think that as a, as a woman growing up to sort of, and to not, and to never have experienced something like that, you can't, not that I would ever want to, um, you, you know, you look at, there's such honor in, in, you know, the, the, the people that survived that situation. I mean, yeah. You have to honour them. It's it's um my God, well, their I don't memory know how lives, they did on, it, lives on in the following generations. I mean, there's so few mm. I mean, there's hardly photos, let alone anything else. I mean, now we live in this, yeah. you know, very fast moving social media world. I mean, everything's recorded. You can like dig up things and yeah. see things, whereas there didn't have that luxury. I think um there was one time when she was quite old and I sort of tried to get out of her the village that she lived in. She called, said it was called Hashvata mm-hmm. and she couldn't tell me how it was spelled. So I had to I was trying to think, Hashvata, how would that be spelled? So her name was Kina, but apparently it was Hina. So I was trying to think now would it be K H A J E and I was trying to figure out how it was spelled. And then I was trying to find a map of like Russia and whether it was in Russia or Poland we don't even know and it was on the river book she kept saying the river book and, and I was sort of trying to figure it out and had to go back quite a, oh it's my daughter I had to go back quite um quite a ways to find a map with mm. this you know this village that is now nothing but a cemetery literally the whole village is a cemetery yeah. but it's not even called that anymore and it's mm. just not even um 
Yeah, it's interesting though, isn't it? Um, How do you feel her story affected you or shaped you? Um, I think she did what was required. And I think that she fought for her life, her family's life. Mm. And she didn't really work, but she did a lot of volunteer and charity work. So I think that probably had an impact on me. Mm. She used to go to Pentonville Prison and, and do manicures for the wives visiting right. the prisoners, which I thought was quite sweet. And she used to do that for so the... Down um, the road here. Yeah. Mm. Um, and she used to used to do it at the Royal Free Hospital as well. And I always thought that's funny because she wasn't a manicurist or anything. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't have wanted to, to paint her nails. <laughs> um, but she... I think it just... I just think she was larger than life. She was very social. She invited everyone into the home. She fed everyone. Um, like I said, she was hilarious. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single friend of mine that doesn't remember grandma. We used to call her Sonia. Grandma, it, with with just love and admiration. My mum's friends all thought she was amazing. Because she was quite... She was just... There was a dy dynamism about her. She was just mm -hmm. very... She like lit up the room. Uh, it was she was astounding, really, mm -hmm. and I and I think that, that coupled with the bravery of like being a sort of eighteen year old new bride with a husband, and you're like fighting in the resistance, you know, in Paris and and then in Brussels, and just you know, um, the bravery of giving up your your baby, giving your baby to a woman to look after her. Mm. She didn't go back for her for two years. She saw her once in two years. Mm -hmm. Imagine doing that, giving mm. your child up to somebody else to save her life, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. So that that must take a huge amount of courage. Mm. You know, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, the, the, the choices that you have to make when you are when you have so limited resources and what do you do? I mean, I grew up, I'm in, I'm Russian. I grew up with, with my grandma as well, because at the time when your parents are so young, I mean, when you have kids, when you're like in your twenties, yeah, so like like 18, like 19, kids 20, by the time she was 21. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And you know, the grandparents kind of take care of you, but when you don't have that and you're just alone in the world, like, mm. I, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I had a hard enough time putting my three, four year old in nursery school, let alone mm. giving my child up to somebody who I don't know. Mm. Um, I think in exchange for a painting, I don't even think the woman got money. I think the woman just took, you know, took my aunt in who I'm actually really close with. Um, and I think my grandmother gave her a painting. Mm. That was all she had. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it is, it's like those, those kind of stories, I think, y you know, it's almost weird to think that's my grandmother mm -hmm. because when I knew her, when I was born, she would she would make me run the bath for her. She would make me get the towels for her. She made me make her bed, mm -hmm. you know. She was like, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then as she got older and she sort of tried to start telling us the stories of her childhood, I it was like... Um, it was like a fairy tale mm. in a weird way. It was a bit Cinderella. It. it was like, yeah. whoa, you know. And then she was living in a penthouse flat in Hampstead. I didn't, I had no idea that she'd been through <laughs> what she'd been through. Mm. Yeah. So, and, and also I think my mum was a bit of a hippie and didn't really wear makeup or anything like that. And so I think my grandmother was very much where I, I got the inspiration from. I would watch her do her hair and put her cream on. And I would say she had this like block of Lancome mascara mm. and it was just a black block with like thing, like a little brush that was like half a toothbrush and she would spit into the block mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then put her mascara mm. on. So things like that, I think really sort of, somebody bought me one of those recently as a yes. present, one of those old mascara yeah. blocks. Yeah. I've seen them so on funny. Lisa Eldridge's um, yeah. videos. Yeah. I thought that was, I, that's the first yeah. time I learned that that's how it was done. Yeah, she used to sit there and spit. And the funny thing was, is that she was so glamorous in every other way, but there was this one thing where she used to like <laughs> spit into the <laughs> mascara. And I used to think, I don't know if I think that's cool or not. Mm, well, that's, it, times have changed. Like things, like, <laughs> things improve, formulas improve. <laughs> I mean, it's your own spit, so maybe yeah. it's okay. But you know, nowadays you wouldn't do that. It'd be difficult mm. to do it behind a mask. But yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> It's so funny, isn't it, how? Mm. Actually, that maybe that's more hygienic than actually the wand going in and out. Who knows? Mm. And is this what inspired you to start your brand, Ruby and Millie? Let's talk about that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's a difficult one, really, what inspired me. I think that the, the opportunity came about and I, I had um, 
so so, so when the we were we were offered to do a brand for boots mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I didn't really want to do it, to be honest. So I kind of, I thought I could get away with creating a brand because the creation side of it, I really wanted to do because mm -hmm. I had worked for a Japanese company and I had developed some um, products that became bestsellers globally. And I really enjoyed the product development side of the of the, the work. So mm -hmm. um, I could really see color and I texture and, and pay off and I knew what I wanted. So I thought I really want the opportunity to develop the range and I could visualize it like immediately. To me, it was a spreadsheet. I could see it. Mm. And, um, but I wasn't necessarily um, terribly comfortable with being at the front of the brand. So in the initial stages, I was going to develop a brand for Ruby and I was going to do the work and she was going to be the face of the brand. But um, the people that were putting the money in wanted us to both front it as a duo and there was a bunch of like um market research done um and actually it didn't come back very well as as us being a duo because ruby had been on tv and i had, was doing her pr at the time mm -hmm. she was on tv and she was on television like makeover shows and she was a very well-known makeup artist and um their research came back that nobody knew who i was so I wasn't at the front. I was the sort of person behind. I'm like the wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> and, All the um, behind the scenes that actually makes it happen. Yeah, I mean, mm. I, I really liked that. And I was really comfortable with that. I didn't feel very comfortable being in front of the camera. And so, mm. so, um, and the research came back sort of saying, well, we don't know who she is. She's just a hanger on. She's just riding on the coattails of mm. her friend. And, um, and I, and actually funny enough, I was pregnant at the time. So Ruby didn't let me see the market research because she knew I'd be upset by it. Mm. So she hid it from me, which was very sweet of her. But, um, I kind of had that same impression that that would maybe visibly not be the best way to kind of, for the brand to come to life. But anyway, it took about a year and a half to convince me. And eventually I was like, okay, fine, we'll do it. I can see that we could market it well with, with both of us being at the front. But the thing for me was sort of um, the exciting bit was to develop something that was our vision. And, and we've always had a very similar aesthetic and we both knew what a good product was. So we knew what we wanted. Um, and so developing that with Ruby was amazing. I mean, just those afternoons and evenings and mornings sitting on the floor with these big sheets of paper going, we want this, 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 these colors. And mm. we, it was really fun doing that. Um, and then, the launch to me was exciting because we launched the marketing concept of the launch was very unique. No one had ever launched in a high end department store and three months later gone into boots and 24 stores pretty much the same day. Mm -hmm. So um, nowadays it's a very sort of common distribution model. If you're a brand, you'll launch in a Liberty or a Selfridges or a Harvey Nichols or Harrods, and then you'll look to have a wider distribution afterwards. No one had ever done that. You'd either had the department stores, high-end premium brands, or the sort of drugstore mainstream brands. The 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 sort of um, uh, the fusion of the premium department store and boots had never happened before. Mm. So that to me was super exciting. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, God, there was a year and a half for me going, mm, no, I don't want to do this. No, 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 no. <laughs> I remember being in Bologna in Italy and I was with my current business partner and I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't mm. want to do it. Just. Are you glad you did it? Yeah. There were some great moments. Mm. There was some like. Do you miss I, it? I don't really miss it. I do, um, no, I, I don't really miss it. What, what I do, there are just some moments that. Ruby and I shared that only Ruby and I will ever know of, you yeah. know, of being in Taiwan or traveling to Thailand or launching in Japan. And there were just things that I'm so glad we did it together because if I did that on my own or she did that on, on her own, there would only be one of us that would remember it. Mm. Whereas we were both there mm. and we both have that sort of, that we've shared that experience. And there were some hilarious moments. I mean, hilarious. Like what? Oh my God when we arrived in Thailand and we were coming from the airport to the hotel and we were in a cab and we just look up and there's literally pictures of us, I don't know, 50, 100 floors high, you know, like we're the advertising of us mm. down the side of a building. 
I mean, if that's you know, just a real like, moment. And also, the traffic doesn't move in Bangkok, so mm. you're in a cab, and I'm like, okay, this needs to go past the picture. I can't really <laughs> look at myself. Yeah, so that's a great things moment. like that. And I think we were in, I think it was Taiwan, and we we came down this staircase for our launch. I remember what I was wearing. I was wearing this Vivian Westwood, white Vivian Westwood sort of corset dress. We came down this staircase, and it was like paparazzi going crazy. And mm. I was like, this feels so weird to me. Mm. Just those kind of funny experiences and just yeah just i mean amazing oh, there's so many amazing moments really mm. yeah going from store to store to store and um opening the stores and meeting the staff and yeah just great doing a tv show that was fun we wrote a book together that was really good fun so yeah what do you feel most proud of Oh God, my kids really, they're mm. so good. Um, <laughs> uh, nothing to do with work. I guess, I mean, I guess the MBA, you know, getting an MBE in 2007 was pretty mm. amazing because obviously that's another shared experience that I had with Ruby. That was pretty phenomenal. Mm. And I had just had my second child then and um, that was that was pretty awesome, you know. So that was quite shocking, really. And I think just what Was it like on the day when there, you were receiving it? Uh, okay, so what was really weird was that they, we went, so you go in and it's all very surreal and, you know, it's sort of uh, the whole place is so stunning. Buckingham Palace is absolutely stunning. And I had gone with my dad and my mum and my older daughter and um, we we get there and you get you go into this room and with everyone else that's getting their sort of investitures that day and they give you this briefing and... The thing that I remember was Hugh Laurie was standing behind us and he was very tall. And they, somebody came up to us and said, would you like to go and get it together? And we said, yeah, definitely, why not? And then about sort of 15, 20 minutes later, they called our names and I just looked at her and I'm like, oh my God, they've made a mistake. We're going to be chucked out. Like, <laughs> this isn't real. But actually they were calling us in because they had to um, walk us through how if you go together you have to walk in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I had these brand new Chanel shoes on and you you have to sort of go up to the queen and then you have to walk backwards. You're not allowed to turn your back to her. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was like moonwalking because I'm like, <laughs> you know, slipping on the carpet. In your Chanel shoes. And then when we, they, she, she actually apparently spoke to us for quite a while. I don't really remember because it's a bit of a blur, but my mm -hmm. dad obviously was watching and he said, oh, she spoke to you longer than she spoke to anyone else. That might've just been my dad <laughs> being soppy. But, um, and then as you go out, you go into this sort of ante room and they take the badge off you. And I started crying because I thought they'd taken it away. <gasps> and I was like, oh my God, they've taken it away. And Ruby was like, they're just putting it in a box. <laughs> so... I think the whole thing is like heightened emotion. It's mm. like, yeah. Well, what was it about this moment that you felt that it's almost like you, it's like it wasn't happening, it wasn't real. It's almost like it wasn't you who was, who it's was doing these things. It's that imposter thing again, isn't it? It's that imposter yeah. thing. Of like, I think like, uh, God, you know, why? Why me? You know, mm. you start to think, why me? That's weird. Mm. Um, I mean, when you... When you go into it academically and you go, okay, well, we employed loads of people. We had a brand that was in hundreds of stores at that point. And, you know, we were truly British brand. Products were manufactured for the most part in the UK. I mean, there's quite a lot of reasons why they would have, you know, given it to us. Um, I want to say it was Sherry Blair that put us up for it. But, you know, got nice letters from Tessa Jowell. And, you know, it was really, it was, it was, yeah, but it was surreal. Mm. It was very surreal. Mm. And I think you do kind of, those moments you do have that feeling of, okay, should this really be me? Mm. Strange, isn't it? Sort of. I think it just affects, I think it affects most people, you know, some of the time. And I think mm. there is, when, I think for women especially it's really hard because when there's yeah. not so many role models that you can look up to and you're kind of paving the way or leading or doing something that, you know, perhaps has not been done before, it's easy to question yourself. I wonder if men have the same feeling. I think That's they the do. thing. I wonder if, I often wonder if men have the same imposter syndrome that women talk about because men don't really talk about that as well, much I as I think that's do. the thing. I think it goes diagnosed or not talked about, but as we're human beings, you know, yeah. when we're doing, when we're daring to do something new or unusual, of course there's going to be some fears, some doubts. It's just, I think for women, we have got used to sharing that. And I think yeah. that makes it easier to deal with. I think, I think the thing is, is there's, 
I feel there's a combination between I don't ever doubt what I'm doing. Mm. Um, so I'm quite clear if I've got an idea in my head, I'm usually quite certain about it. And I'm quite sort of, um, like I said, demonstrative. Like mm. I, I knew that we had to do the British Beauty Council. I knew that Ruby and Millie was the right thing to do. I knew, you know, I, I know certain things are the right thing to do at the, set, at the, set, at the right time or the certain time. And I feel very strongly and I'm very convinced about it, but in convincing other people, because oftentimes you have to convince other people because you can't do these things alone. You need money and you need, mm. you know, an office and staff and, you know, collaborators, etc. Sometimes then you think, hmm, should it be me doing this or should it be somebody else? So I'm, I'm usually quite sort of um, uh, certain about the idea that it should happen. I'm not always certain that I'm the best person to drive it. Mm. So I think that's sort of the strange conundrum. And at which point do you decide? Like, how do you make a decision saying, okay, maybe I'm not so good at this and I need to bring somebody else to do um, this? I've learned over the years that I'm actually quite good at getting things started. Mm. So I'm very good at sort of kicking them off. I'm it's nimble, creative. I don't sleep a lot, so I can work very, very hard. I work very long hours, uh, mostly seven days a week at the moment. Um, and I, I know that there will become a time very soon probably where this my job should be somebody else's mm -hmm. because I'm not the person to take it to the next stage I'm just mm -hmm. not so you just enjoy the creative aspect and sort of you know starting yeah. and I, like, I enjoy that adrenaline going. rush mm. of getting something started do you um, get tired from doing that uh no <laughs> I'm tired now because I think I'm having a bit of a dip because after the sort of, you know, starting the British Beauty Council, the first year of like trying to prove ourselves and trying mm. to prove that we're doing the right thing. Mm. And then obviously COVID hit and we're one of those sort of organisations that just transitioned and managed the situation, I think, pretty brilliantly to the point where the, the what we were trying to prove the year before, we undoubtedly provided proof that we can, you know, lead mm -hmm. from the front, really. Um and now it's like, I just feel like I'm having a little break and that's making me a little bit tired. But no, no, not, not in the beginning. No, I've got adrenaline and it just... Energising. Oh, totally energising, mm. yeah. Do you, how do you think the pandemic has impacted how you view the world? Um, God, in a lot of ways, um, uh, there's so many things, so many things. Um, I for, Personally, for me, it's made me realise that I do... I live in London. I live in close to central London. I love it. It's a choice that I've made to live here. My family, a lot of them live in America. Um, mm -hmm. I've decided that there are certain things that um, I believe in and certain things that I hold very dear to my heart. And I love working, but I need to find a better life balance. So definitely that's made a big difference to my life. I need to and I've been thinking of where to buy a house outside of the UK. Um, but I, I do think that that's, it's, it's changed how I view what I do. Mm. So um, that's really important. Um, I think we've been through something quite traumatizing. And I think a lot of people will have PTSD mm -hmm. after this experience. A lot of people have suffered. Um, I've realized you can't help everyone. Yeah. You know, no matter how hard you try. I mean, when the whole world is affected, yeah. like, there's a lot of yeah. people to help. Yeah. Mm. And uh, and I do feel like um, I'm not a saviour. You know, it's not my not my. Uh, it's not. I can't do that. You know, I'm not. I'm not that person. However, but I feel I like, like you like are doing be. that. Um, I feel like. Uh, I feel like at the beginning I thought I could do it and that was what I was doing. But actually, as you as time goes on, I really think what I was doing was filling up my day so that I got through it in, in the same way. So I'm not and it's mm. not so in, in a weird way. Yes, I did. I have helped a lot of people. I do recognize that. And I and I am very, very proud of that fact. But it's not a totally selfless task because if I hadn't have been doing the amount of work that I was doing throughout the past 18 months, I wouldn't have survived it. Mm. So um, now I look back on it, I think, my God, if I hadn't have done what I did. Where do you think this comes from for you? Uh, I don't know. 
Well, it's like being at the therapist. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a very good, very mm. good question. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know. I just feel like uh, I'm quite a strong person, so I just felt like I was capable maybe. Um, I don't know, just my instinct, gut instinct. It was like, what do they call it? Flight, f- fight or flight. Fl- mm-hmm. Flight or fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, flight or fight. Um I'm a fighter. I just thought, I'm going to stick around, bed in. I'm a Taurus. I'm like a bull. <laughs> like, you know, I sort of feel like I just put my feet on the ground and thought, okay, what do we do? Mm. You know, and that's sort of my personality. Mm-hmm. don't really know where it came from. Mm. But I'm like that, yeah, it's sort of, um, and and I'm resourceful because I've, I've worked, I mean, my business, my current business partner was um, beauty director at British Vogue and she's an amazing journalist. She can, research anything find anything out um so in the beginning just the sort of doing the research trying to find the right people to connect with the government level to be able to kind of help people i was incredibly resourceful i think Mm -hmm. some people Mm -hmm. you know and 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 i know the industry well so i know that if you're if government write guidance and it's 200 pages long people aren't going to read it Mm -hmm. It needs to be translated into you know a summary not not 200 pages who's going to read that Mm -hmm. So you can hardly re- read the Instagram feed, let alone. I know it's like you know, there's so documents. much stuff that we have to read, and we're mm. trying to absorb s- stuff all the time. And a lot of times, when you're a visual or creative person, just to sit down and read pages and pages of small writing that's in jargon that makes no sense, mm-hmm. it's impossible. Mm-hmm. So um, I felt I understood the industry enough. And I had a sort of well-rounded view of it that I could see it from all the different mm-hmm. perspectives. Because um, whilst maybe it looks like we championed hairdressers and beauty therapists, actually, if you think about those businesses, there are there's an entire supply chain that's affected by the closures of those businesses. Mm-hmm. So there are brands that that are hiring hundreds of people in this country that couldn't operate because those businesses were closed so it's not just about the sort of the staff on the shop floor although they did need representation those people but you know there's a huge industry that kind of like you know is is from a to z you know that is affected along the way even down to people who work in the warehouses people that drive the the vans and you know distribution companies Mm -hmm. fulfillment companies for e-commerce you know People that pack the boxes up of the stuff that you buy mm. from ASOS or, you know, cult the whole beauty ecosystem. Or, yeah, of, whole ecosystem. Yeah. Everyone was affected. Yeah. So, you know, um, and I kind of have a good v- visual on that whole, on how it all connects. Mm-hmm. What do you think the industry needs now? Oh, goodness. Uh, money. <laughs> um, clients to go back. Um, I think we need to take stock of what's happened. A, a lot of a lot of what's happened in the industry, a lot of the transition from February 2020 to now were things that were going to happen. They just happened faster and the we were prepared. Mm-hmm. So retail to e-commerce, uh, salons to self-employed there's a lot of things that transition quite quickly Um, now what we need to do is look at where we are and adapt Mm -hmm. and also look at future proofing our industry so i think the industry needs to um well the the biggest thing for me is that um it's a sort of kind of geeky thing but there is our industry um has a code a four-digit code that the government use, governments all over the world use to when you pay your taxes, when you, you know, register your business. And that code uh, was developed in 1948. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing right now is to get that code updated so that it truly reflects the variety of, of our workforce. Because there were a lot of challenges with getting us what we needed because the government didn't really know very much about how our industry is made up. And so if there's one thing I would say that we need to fight for, it's a change to our SIC code. Right. Because it 
our code right now is a subdivision of another code. It's not even a code in its of its own. And it's it's um, hair and other beauty treatments. It's not specific enough. Mm -hmm. So there is no um, no drill down on our definition. People, you know, the government don't know. Mm. I feel like it's sort of almost not their fault. They didn't really know how our industry was made up. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of their fault because they should have reviewed the code and made it more 21st century. Mm. I mean, it's from the 1950s, essentially. Mm. I feel because... There isn't, there hasn't been anyone shouting about it. These are the problems because, yeah. as you said, you know, there's so many small, independent women predominantly <clears throat> involved in that, and just having some kind of a body that unites them and yeah. provides the voice. And I feel like you've been leading in that. You have to kind of bring people together to give them, mm -hmm. and and also I think if you have a bit of courage, you really helps to give people a springboard. Like one of the things that I've really loved over the past 18 months more than anything is small business owners who have struggled, who have taken to social media, created a platform for themselves and spoken from their heart and soul and very loudly. These women have become activists and in their own right. And I, I just applaud them. I think that that's just remarkable. And if I've had anything to do with that, I'm so, so super proud of it. Mm. You know, it's not mm. about... The, I mean, there are things that I'm proud of, like the government, you know, the personal care sector team that we now have at government and, and the relationships we have with policymakers. It's all amazing. But the most thing, the thing I'm most proud of is allowing women the opportunity to kind of shout loudly. Mm -hmm. I feel you've really done mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I feel that's probably my finest moment, you know, is really helping them to kind of find their voice. That's, that's, yeah. And, it, and if I have done that, I'm really proud of it you know what does leadership mean to you um oh, in a weird way this what came into my head was taking risk mm. and owning it so you know if you taking you, there's two ways taking a risk can go either it can be a very great success or not and i think you have to own it either way what's the biggest risk you've taken oh i take risks every day <laughs> I just am a risk taker. Uh, yeah, there's too many, too many to say. I, I take risks every day. I'm like, I, again, I like the sort of adrenaline rush of it. Is that weird? I don't know. Maybe that's a bit. Not at all. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm just a constant risk taker. I think it's so key. I, I mean, we talk you know, about making mistakes, taking you know, making bold moves, and I love the fact that you're saying you're taking kind of risks every day because it's it desensitizes you to some extent also mm. from yeah. kind of failing because it's like a risk means that it might not go the way that you anticipate it to go but you do it anyway and it's kind of yeah. facing the fears and doing that on a daily basis and then you know you can figure out what's working and what's not but if you don't try if you don't test it then you're just never going to learn are yeah you? I mean I guess if I get I'm just thinking like career-wise I worked for a company called sure more I'd worked there for quite some years I was senior management level of retail and um, I had the opportunity to leave where I lived and f come to Europe and open it here that was a risk I was mm -hmm. mm, 21 maybe something 20 22 23 maybe and then a couple of years later I decided to uh, really fight with my bosses to put that Shuemura business into a fashion boutique called Space NK. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the only beauty offer in that store. Um, that was a risk because there was no other beauty offer. Um, and then a year or so later, I was offered to work with Aveda. Um, and my dad knew Horst Recklebacher and it all seemed great and they were going to match my salary. And I thought, why am I leaving a job that I love to a job that I'm not sure I'm going to love, but I might do. Mm -hmm. Why don't I just set up my own business and take work for both of them? So I mm -hmm. did that, which was quite risky because I was only like 24 and I was, you know, I was, I was earning quite a bit of money because I was earning both salaries from both businesses and I was as a consultant. So that was quite risky. And then had my own PR agency. Uh, then I had Ruby and Millie. 
um, which again was another risk because I had to give up my PR agency that I had a lot of comfort in and I had autonomy with and I had to put myself in front of a brand, which was a big risk for me. I had a lovely anonymous life, you know. I didn't <laughs> need to be in the public eye at all. Um, and um, so that was a huge risk. And then even walking away from that 20 years later was a risk because, you know, at the end of the day, that was, you know... Um, I felt like I didn't have control over it. So therefore I thought, oh, I'd rather just walk away from it and not, mm. not continue. And then I opened a shop, which was a complete and utter risk, just as we were going into sort of this retail depression where shops were really struggling, which was a huge risk. Um, and then the British, Be I don't know, I think they've all been quite risky mm. work-wise. And I think personally I'm quite risky. Mm. What didn't Risque. work out? <laughs> risky. Oh God, loads of it didn't. Mm. Um, but not not for any reason like it didn't really work out. I mean, everything's kind of um, worked out to some degree in terms of um, uh, making a name for itself or being renegade in what it was or being the first of its kind. I mean, Ruby and Millie doesn't exist anymore, but you'd be hard pushed to find anybody, anyone of between the ages of, let's say, you know, 25 and I don't know, 75 or whatever, 80, that doesn't remember the brand as being very renegade and kind of ahead of its time. Or, you know, Beauty Mart, the shop, was very ahead of its time. Um, and, uh, you know, Shuamora was an amazing brand. I mean, it, it predated Mac or um, Laura Mercier or Trish Mac or any of the brands that came after it, Bobby Brown. So, um, and, and so the launch here, you know, it doesn't exist here anymore. So that, you know, it feels like a bit of a failure that the brands left the territory. Mm -hmm. It's not my doing, I, you know, but um, it had its moment, you know. It did what I it was intended to do. I love the brand. I actually have still products that I bought in Japan. Oh, it's my mm. favourite. Mm -hmm. Absolutely my favourite. Amazing. I'm a huge fan of Japanese products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk to me about Aveda and launching that. I mean, it's a story I heard on Clubhouse, but our listeners might be interested. <laughs> yeah, so it was a funny one because, um, so Ruby used to come into Shuamora on a Saturday with her husband and uh, her husband, George, rode a motorcycle and he used to come in with their helmets and he used to sort of leave Ruby to shop and hang out at Shuamora and he used to walk around. And um, Ruby had... Uh, before she'd met her husband, dated a guy who uh, was from Minneapolis originally. And he um, was in, he's, he's sort of still very visible in the beauty industry. Um, but he had, his family had had, had owned an aluminium recycling business. And he had met after Ruby, this makeup artist called Sonia Kashuk. So he'd gone from Ruby to this other makeup artist. Obviously he has a, Thing for makeup artists quite interesting but um and they met Horst Reckelbacher who owned Aveda and Ruby was still in touch with him and he introduced Ruby to Horst Reckelbacher the owner of Aveda and George and Ruby obviously were then as a couple connected with the brand and um my dad is a hairdresser, so he knew Horst because Horst was, is, was an Austrian hairdresser mm -hmm. who had moved to America. My dad's an English hairdresser who had moved to America. And I think a lot of the, you know, immigrant or expat, mm -hmm. you know, um, hairdressers kind of had a bit of a community. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so they, so George and Ruby had this idea to bring Aveda to the UK and they approached me to work with them. And it turned out that because Horst knew my dad, he felt comfortable with me being involved because he was very protective of the brand. I think they'd been in the US, there was, it was um, very common that there was sort of, um, uh, sort of diverted stock distribution. So as a brand, you would sell to one salon and instead of selling to that one salon and two others in the town, that salon would divert the stock to other people. Um, so he was quite nervous and protective over his distribution network. And this was a big, important territory for him coming to the UK. And so um, he was quite pleased that I was going to be involved. And for some reason, I was named in the contract as a key person so that the deal was done if I was involved. Mm -hmm which is weird because I wasn't involved for that long, the first few years. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we, so we launched in the UK. And I think that um, 
I was really adamant that we launched in a department store, even though Horst was very anti-department stores because it was a salon brand at the, t at the time in the US. And then we launched on QVC, which was quite renegade as well at the time. And Horst was mortified. Cause, but, but, it was really, but it was a really interesting distribution plan because it was something that was different. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, it was a, a distribution plan that we had, um, that I had um, trialed with Shuemura anyway that worked for that brand. So I thought it was quite a clever one for Aveda. And then what happened was because of it being in a department store and being on QVC, it gave us a lot of visibility. So all the salons kind of flocked to us. We yeah. didn't have to work as hard to go out there and sell what was essentially to a lot of people an unknown brand because QVC, even if people weren't buying from QVC, it had a massive audience, mm -hmm. um, and nationwide. So it became, you know, a lot of people would see us and go, oh, yes, I saw that on QVC. Mm. So it's, it, QVC is great because it's just brilliant advertising. It's just a great exposure. Really mm. good exposure. And really, Avedo, I think, was either the or one of the first beauty brands on QVC UK. Mm. So it was a big risk mm -hmm. to take. Um, and he was really not very happy about it but we felt very strongly that it was the right thing to do and also just the revenue that you get from it it helps to provide funding to be able to do other things that you need to do if you're going to grow a brand and um oh yeah it was a, a, an amazing experience really an amazing experience he was such a nice guy who was he like to work with oh he was hilarious I remember once going to um being invited i went with george actually we went to osceola which was he has um so he had this sort of evader headquarters in minneapolis in a sort of like re not a retail park but like a business park you know massive in fact it was their business park it wasn't there was no other company there and it was such a nice environment you could bring your children to work and there was a crash and mm -hmm. it was just the kind of environment you would expect from somebody like him and then he had a spa and where he lived in a place called Osceola that's on the Wisconsin Minnesota border and you would go there and stay there and then you would go to the headquarters to work every day and when I got there the first time they tried to give me an enema and I was like <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not doing this and they were like, well, horse wants everyone to have an animal when they come. And I'm like, mm, not me, sorry. Um, and then you would, in the evenings, he would like to get you into this sort of a tent sweat lodge where you would sweat. Detoxify. And yeah, and he would ask you lots of questions just to sort of test, you know, make sure that you're honest and, you know, mm. just put you under a lot of physical pressure. Mm. Uh, so there were some funny things like that. I remember once going to the spa and they developed this um, chakra shower. So you lie on a bed naked on your front mm -hmm. and they have these shower heads that hit the chakras. But one of the chakras is kind of not in a very nice place. It's sort of pointed to your um, tailbone. Right. Mm -hmm. Which came as a bit of a shock <laughs> to me because I wasn't quite prepared for that mm -hmm. at all. So that yeah, there was some fun moments. There it's was like <laughs> it's like you're being almost physically tested and kind of exposed and sort of detoxified. That there is no way not to be kind of open and yeah. you know yeah. you're kind of like completely exposed. Yeah, yeah. and it, it was really um, working for Veda feels like or felt like to me at the time that your insides are on your outside. Mm. And, you know, we had just been at, through the 80s where everything was masked. You know, it was like sort of um, the, the makeup style and how people dressed and everything was like so overly done. And then all of a sudden here I am working for really the world's first sort of, you know, natural beauty, not really the first actually body shop, but, um, you know, one of the first natural brands. And um, and I, you were just exposed in every way, shape or form. It was completely bizarre. But, yeah, so so inspiring. And what a guy. Yeah, he was amazing. Mm. I mean, he lived and breathed everything. And he was so involved in the development of the product, which I think, again, was uh, both him and Mr. Shuamura, when we developed Ruby and Mini, I think that was, and really inspired me. When you see the founder of the brand so, so engrossed in the physical 
makeup of each product. Mm. That's quite amazing. So my question is, is that, you know, for beauty brands who are launching or already launched and, you know, really kind of trying to get their brand out there, what's the best advice you can give them? Oh, I just always say, I mean, first of all, surround yourself with experts. That's mm -hmm. just the most important thing because you'll never be an expert in everything. Um, and, um, and just have broad shoulders and expect not to sleep a lot. <laughs> um, yes. I don't know if I'd do it again, the mm. brand side of it, but I mean, I guess in an essence, British Beauty Council is a brand in a weird way, um, mm -hmm. albeit different. I've never worked for a non-profit. I've never run a non-profit before. Mm -hmm. So I've learned a lot the past three years. Um, but I, I would say that yeah, it's about surrounding yourself with people that can really support you and have an, an expert knowledge in something you don't. Mm. Lawyers, accountants, great people mm. to have around you. And advice for yourself, so personal advice, like what three pieces of, of advice you would give your younger self? Relax, relax, relax. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's funny when we look back and it's like, <laughs> it's going to be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. It's I fine. just don't see that at the time. Yeah. I mean, I think I don't I don't relax anyway, like mm. sort of physically and mentally. Mm. Um I don't relax in terms of when I'm building up something. Um and when I'm awake, I'm just not relaxed. I don't know how to be awake and relaxed at the same time. So the mm. the whole my sort of life plan now is to sort of buy a house somewhere, spend a few years going back and forth until I finally go and, you know, I want to live in a village with three people. I don't, I want that kind of slightly peaceful bit because I think that I need to have that to find a true balance because I cannot relax while I'm here in London, which is to me, it's my workplace. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm going to have to force myself to yeah. learn to relax. I, I identify with that. It's like, it's almost like all or nothing because it's like yeah. when you're so focused, you don't really even think about it. Always like, oh, I can't stop. I have to keep going. But then you really feel it in yourself that actually you need a break. I mean, for me, I have to learn how to incorporate it into my day to day because I don't. Yeah, I think it's. I, I think envy it's people that that mm. can meditate in the morning or go to the mm. gym or do this and that. I mean, I do walk a lot. I, I mm. walk. I like my my walk in the woods. I like. Um, I do like the outdoors, mm -hmm. but I do need to force myself to to learn to relax. And and I am a heavy sleeper. I have to say, when I do sleep, I might not sleep for very long, but I'm literally out cold. Mm. Like you could hit me over the head with a hammer, and I wouldn't even wake up. I really, <laughs> like you I really, really need that deep I sleep. I really do. And actually, yeah. funny enough, I was saying to uh, a couple of friends of mine recently that. I, when the weekend comes, if I've got no work, which is rare, but generally I try to sort of at least have one day where I do nothing. Um, I do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't even, I don't answer the phone, nothing. Don't talk to anybody. I just could lie on the sofa and just, I can make them, you know, <laughs> in a sleep state in a weird way because it, I just have to totally tune out recharge the batteries i think that's so good to do that and especially you know mm. when you're so people facing and you're dealing a lot with other people you need time for yourself as well and yeah. to not be bombarded with so much that's going on externally i feel i feel like uh the thing i feel most guilty about really is probably with my kids my daughter my older daughter lives in la um and she want to FaceTime me on a Saturday night and it's like the last thing i want to do is like mm. be on any kind of computer equipment after mm -hmm six days of zoom mm. um and but i think she's starting to understand that it, it's not anything other than the fact that i just technology to me at that point is like i'm done with it i want to throw my phone across the room mm. um my little one is 14 and i uh i need to probably carve out more time spent with her because this past 18 months has been have been crazy so um and i and i think that there's you know, she's gone from being a 12 year old teenager to a 14 year old full blown teenager mm. during a pandemic, mm. you know? And so I think there's some things I'd probably need to figure out really yeah. in terms of my, my sort of personal role as a mother and a, maybe a, a mentor or a role model, or whatever it might be. Mm. Because I think that if I don't have adequate balance, I'm not really representative or not representing well enough and I, I want to be able to do that so I've got mm. some things to learn 
I think the pandemic has given us room to, well, facing fears, facing this fear of uncertainty, you know, all of this anxieties about like what, what's going to happen and just, you know, past traumas as well, I think, come up mm. when we're facing something so you yeah. know, huge yeah. and um, and trying hopefully to learn from this and, and move forward. Well, last question, Millie, mm -hmm. my new favorite question, like what seems impossible to you now? But if you could make that happen, will change the course of your work or your life. Oh, it seems impossible now. I mean, I guess maybe it's sort of more government related. I mean, uh, I mean, what seemed impossible two years ago has happened mm -hmm. in terms of our sort of relationship with government. Um, One of the things that I feel like is a challenge and where I don't know if it's impossible necessarily is I would like to see a sort of beauty czar at government level. Mm. You know, somebody within the government that really champions our industry. So that that's something that I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's going to it's How can we get that person there? Who can it be? Um no, it should be somebody who, in politics. Like I don't really mm. have any aspirations to to be in politics. Mm. Um certainly not this time my life it seems far too stressful <laughs> and they're much younger than i am a lot of a lot of them um i think it would be who who it would be that seems impossible do you know what i'm really good at like visualizing what something should be that i cannot quite figure it out mm. i cannot figure out if anybody's got any great ideas as to a politician that would be really truly brilliantly representative of this sort of you know, creative and intellectual flair that our industry has. Mm -hmm. I would love to know. Well, I anyone cannot, watching or listening, yeah, let us know. <laughs> I don't know who to approach. No. I mean, there are some sort of amazing people like Caroline Noakes, um, who really has supported, mm -hmm. you know, our services industry um, and really shouted loudly about women um in the workforce um so there are some sort of contenders let's say but mm. but um yeah i think that's sort of you know other industries have that yeah uh we don't yet but mm. i'm hopeful well let's see let's see you never know you never putting know. it out there into the world yeah mm. this is the first time i put it out there into the world Let's see. Maybe, Let's see what maybe happens. Maybe somebody so else will like, suggest, make I a suggestion and make like it happen. Going, going back to your original question, I don't necessarily think anything's impossible, mm -hmm. but I think that sometimes we we have a phobia of failure, so we don't put it out there, and we might never have a beauty czar and government, but um, got to put it out there. Because if you don't, then what? You, you, you know, you're never going to find out. Then it is impossible. Mm -hmm. If you don't try, it is impossible. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, Millie, thank you so thank much you. for coming and thank for joining you. and for sharing your story and just love hearing your, you know, your journey and what happened and just fascinating. And I think the work that you're doing is incredible. Thank you. And I really hope that you in yourself believe that that's really making a huge impact. And, you know, and some days I do, really... some days I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah, really do. Normal. Thank you so much for having me. So nice to meet you yeah, face to face, you. finally. Definitely. Not through the phone. I know. So crazy. Much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. I hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world. Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made, and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO, or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.